Prof Jia, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. Are China and the US heading for an inevitable showdown, even more than this trade dispute? Well, nothing is inevitable, but we are seemingly heading in that direction eh? because uh, there are many uh, signs of uh, hostility and confrontation. Eh? In the old days when you said inevitable showdown, you would have said, oh, tariffs are an inve inevitable showdown. But now tariffs are almost normal. Uh, it's been going on, going on close on two years now. Again, nothing is inevitable. When we talk about showdown, we are talking about a sort of end game. Okay? End game means uh, probably a confrontation on all fronts. We're not, not just uh, economic uh, trade wars, uh, technology uh, restrictions, but also military confrontation and also ideological rivalry. Okay. So are we going to see that happen over the next few years? That's going to be a much, much more obvious conflict? I think the trade war is uh, not over. And technological war just begins. The banning of Huawei products in, in the US is beginning. Uh, and also the, the banning of sales of uh, high-tech uh, products like chips to Chinese companies is also beginning. Uh, and, and also the effort to force other countries not to s uh, use Huawei products is intensifying. Okay. So this is just beginning. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, if it's not uh, changed, it's going to engulf the two countries, uh, not only, uh, and other countries, not only in technological terms, but also in trade terms. Because a lot of things now are, are, are equipped with chips. The uh, interconnected world that we live in. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, products will be considered security risks. You're, you're painting a very pessimistic picture. Let me play the devil's advocate and, and argue the opposite. The IMF just recently said that China is still going to grow by probably about 6%. Now, that, of course, is much lower than what it used to in its heyday, but one could argue that this was inevitable, that China was going to slow down anyway. This has a lot to do with the fact that we are still benefiting from globalization, from trade with each other, from uh, benign interactions with each other. Okay. But this is changing. Okay. Uh, we see anti-globalization trends going on, uh, threatening uh, the trade relationship, uh, the friendly, benign, social relationship between countries and I think the world people as well as the American people should stand up and resist this okay? and this is against everybody's interest. Okay? Uh, the reason that we uh, talk about the negative things is that we hope that this is not going to uh, go on like this. Okay. We want a change for the better. Okay. Let, me, let me come to one of the questions uh, that uh, is very pressing for 2020, and that is the U.S. presidential election. It's all pointing to President Trump coming in for another term. And even if he didn't, and there was a new president from another political party, would we actually see a difference? Most people, in, in, I mean, the, the policy uh, political elite, uh, they believe that the, uh, the U.S. has to take up its own responsibilities as a world leader. It's in U.S. interests. Uh, has to work with others uh, 
has to uh, engage in free trade and uh, also uh, cooperate with others on security issues. Okay. You can't do it alone. It's too costly and it's not going to be effective. So, uh, and you have to be predictable. You can't just try to get a short-term advantages by giving people surprises. Okay. Well, so all this is going to change. President Trump would argue that he has gained advantages by short-term shocks like this, that he would not have achieved the same kinds of concessions for the opening up of the Chinese market if he hadn't gone and gone in hitting hard uh, with the tariffs. And that, that that's the exact thing he criticizes his predecessors for, that they all went way too softly, softly. Well, it's one thing to uh, uh, demand China to change uh, in a reasonable way. It's another thing to demand China to change in an unreasonable way. Okay. I think demand balance of trade or reciprocal trade is quite unreasonable. Okay. This is the 21st century. Okay. China's exports to the U.S. reflect exports of other countries to the U.S. because China imports parts, patents, technologies from other countries, including from the U.S. How can you balance uh, China-U.S. trade without balancing a China trade with other countries. Okay, so this is a, a quite unreasonable. Diplomats should handle certain things. They can do it much better than amateurs. Russia and China have traditionally, at least in the past, been allies. Uh, they have usually voted in the Security Council very often uh, on the same side on, on many issues. Now, though, we seem to be moving towards an even closer new order of relationships with uh, China and Russia. Where is that coming from? Does China really trust Russia more than the US? Well, first of all, I think the two countries began to get closer to each other because of Western pressures, especially pressures from the U.S. Okay. China and Russia want to show to Americans and, 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 and Europeans that if you push us too hard, we become allies, <laughs> in a way, to ward off some of the pressures. Over time, uh, I think the two countries develop closer relationship, not only politically, but also economically. Okay. Uh, and, and still over time, they develop closer security ties. Okay. China, uh, at the moment, probably trusts Russia more than the US, uh, because Russia doesn't challenge China's core national interests, like Taiwan, like uh, China's internal affairs. Okay. You're thinking China of, of Xinjiang trust, at the moment? Yeah, Xinjiang at the moment, and Hong Kong. Hong Kong. China mm -hmm. does not intervene, interfere in Russia's domestic politics. Okay. So uh, this is a foundation, political foundation for the relationship. Okay. Uh, we, we uh, out of past track record, we believe that we are not undermining each other country's uh, author uh, legitimacy. But Russia will never be a substitute to China for the U.S. 
What I'm saying is that China and Russia are getting closer, uh, in part because they don't interfere into each other country's internal affairs. They respect the other side's uh, core national interests. And okay. well, that's an ideological issue, but, isn't that? Uh, well, it's ideological. It's also realistic. Um, but I'm not saying that China is using Russia to replace the U.S. Okay. I think China still wants to get to maintain good relationship with the U.S. But Chinese efforts are facing greater challenges from the Trump administration okay, and also from the U.S. Congress. Russian and Chinese navies, uh, together with Iran, actually did an exercise in uh, the Gulf of Oman. The U.S. is doing this all the time. Other countries are doing this all the time. China, because it's uh, development and defense modernization, it has more resources to do military exercises. So we shouldn't read anything into the fact that China is doing these military exercises in places they've not done so previously? China used to be invited to the uh, Pacific Rim uh, uh, ex military exercise organized by the U.S. Uh, now they don't invite China to go there. Um, I, I think it's good for China to get involved in such kind of military exercise, multilateral military exercise, so that China get Chinese Navy, Chinese uh, military get uh, to know the outside world much better. Uh, and also for the outside world to gain uh, more insight on Chinese military. Prof. Jia, you come from the same, so to say, pedigree in terms of your education, uh, from that very small number of elite Beijing universities that produce the top diplomats, um, invariably skilled in speaking other languages, uh, trained in foreign policy, uh, and uh, the people who have come out of these, these top universities from current Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi to many other of the very distinguished uh, ambassadors. You've all been, in other words, schooled in a certain kind of thinking. This crossing of swords in an elegant in an elegant fight. But that's not really what we're seeing now. We're seeing street brawling. That seems to be a much more uh, potent approach that the Trump administration is engaging in. Are therefore the top diplomats in China really prepared for what's going on now? I think a lot of people were surprised at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, diplom diplomacy can be conduct conducted this way. Okay. There are exceptions in every country, but in the U.S., it's the top diplomat that's doing this. That's different. Okay. Um, I think we should return to some traditional diplom diplomacy. Uh, uh, diplomats should handle certain things. They can do it much better than amateurs. And uh, we will be able to reduce a lot of conflicts, unnecessary, okay. and defend our national interests at the same time. Why is it necessary for China to go down the road of having aircraft carrier at all? the new aircraft carrier that China has commissioned. Aircraft carriers are traditionally seen as being a um, projection of power rather than defensive. This is China's uh, second aircraft carrier. This is a homegrown one. Why is it necessary for China to go down the road of having aircraft carrier at all? 
Well, this has a lot to do with, uh, first, China's uh, economic interests are, glowing, are going global. So there is a need for, China, for, for, for the Chinese Navy to protect the Chinese citizens uh, once they are in danger. Okay. And uh, second, China can afford to do this now because of economic development. Okay. Third, I think uh, the Navy has an incentive to do it because this is about status. Okay. Um, and also uh, the ability to live up to their responsibilities okay, of protecting the country. Okay. But aren't we seeing, therefore, a change? Because protecting a country was once defined previously as being then China, as in geographically China itself. Now it is projecting to being protecting China's interests. And China's interests might be anywhere else in the world. And that's a very, very different idea altogether from saying you're protecting yourself geographically to protecting your interests in the world. Well, uh, there is a logic to it. When the Libya case uh, came up, China suddenly found 30,000 Chinese laborers, uh, laborers in, in Libya. So they have to be evacuated. Uh, uh, they, you their have life has to be pro to pro protected. People. Well, if you have an aircraft carrier there, people are not going to kill uh, to to hurt them. Uh, and of course, uh, this is uh, one argument of it uh, for, to it. Uh, uh, the there is still a f another argument that is. Uh, China is going to be a superpower. Some would argue it is already. Yeah. As a superpower, you can only protect your interests by maintaining the world order. Okay. So China is going to have more responsibilities to uh, maintain the world order, including to make sure that the, 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 the passages uh, 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 open uh, for trade. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly Safe, what safety. the U.S. says as well, Prof. Exactly. Yeah, that, so, so we're getting really just the same rhetoric China from the two big the, superpowers. China and the U.S. are going to have similar uh, interests as superpowers. Okay. They, they cannot take a free ride of the existing international order anymore because they are too big. If they take a free ride, the system collapses. Okay. The bus collapses. Okay. Uh, China is uh, becoming more and more aware of this. So, so basically, China is saying that we are going to drive the bus, too. President Trump is taking the other uh, approach. Uh, U.S. used to take uh, to to drive the bus, and now he's saying that, how come China took a free ride? The U.S. want to take a free ride too. <laughs> so uh, he he started the trade wars and uh, you know uh, exit the some international many increasing international institutions. So here, what I'm saying is, but well, we are going to have China and U.S. actually as superpowers. They have similar interests. They have increasingly similar interests. It's better for them to work together rather than to, uh, to complement each other, rather than to, 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 to confront each other. Okay. If China wants, I remember years ago, uh, the commander in chief of the uh, Pacific uh, Command, he urged to build, uh, he, he called other countries to build a, a 1,000 ship. Uh, fleet to protect the sea lanes. It's not just the U.S. It's it's every country, and in part because of that, China sent warships to the Gulf of Eden 
to protect the, 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 the ships, the cargo ships. Uh, the, you know, that was the parking ceiling mm -hmm. is a very costly mm -hmm. business. Yes. It's uh, in everybody's interest that the ceilings are open and, and free. Uh, so the US, uh, U.S. cannot afford to do it itself, a thousand ships. China cannot afford to do it itself. Other countries cannot do it by itself. So we need uh, countries to put, pull together their resources to help protect the sea lanes. So China and the US probably it's in their interest to make sure the other side <laughs> contribute to protect the sea lanes. So I think this is probably a better way for, for the two countries and other countries to have a navy. <laughs> to have a stronger navy, uh, uh, rather than you know squandering their resources to confront each other, is China going to make Southeast Asia decide whether they're backing a China horse or a U.S. horse? I don't think China is going to make Southeast Asia to take side. The U.S. has has been doing that, uh, and I. I don't think it's uh, wise for Southeast Asian countries to to take side because it's in their interest to, to have room of flexibility and um, taking side is quite risky. Yeah. It doesn't help uh, from the Southeast Asian perspective. From Chinese perspective, of course, why not take the Chinese side? <laughs> <laughs> Prof Jia, thank you very much, as always, for being on In Conversation. Sure, thank you.